Now, if you want to look at it in terms of absolute numbers, the absolute weight loss was 15.3 kilograms, which is almost 34 pounds. What's up guys, Derek, MorePlaceMoreDates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about semaglutide again. This is the premier GLP-1 agonist that is the most efficacious at reaching clinical endpoints in a um, diabetes management plus obesity management now aspect. It has been presented in a format of 2.4 milligrams per week as Wegovy, dumbest name ever perhaps, yes, I agree, versus the one milligram variation um, Ozempic, and then obviously there's uh, not obviously there is an oral iteration as well, but that does not seem to be the best way to go. You know, it's for people who just like really don't want to fucking inject something, um, but it's ultimately going to be a lot more distress on the GI than otherwise just pinning it would be. And it's a subcutaneous injection, it's kind of just like pinning insulin. However, you only have to do it once a week, you know, very, very well-tolerated medication that has very benign slash innocuous profile relative to other kind of, you know, weight management tools that we're more familiar with, like stimulant abuse or anything like dopaminergic agents that are going to be problematic down the line in a neurological aspect, in a cardiovascular aspect, etc. Obviously, there's other kind of like appetite suppressants out there, but ultimately, GLP-1, G I can't fucking talk, GLP-1 agonist, from what I've seen, seem to be the most promising in a you know benign activity aspect now are they side effect free of course not and some individuals end up like literally puking when they use this stuff however semaglutide in particular of all the glp1 agonists when you compare it to dulaglutide liraglutide all of the different variants it seems to be the most efficacious like i mentioned and with the most i don't know it's like easiest to adhere to as well and just produces the most weight loss as well so anyways as well as you know best improvements in uh um, like glucose tolerance metrics and whatnot. But anyways, semaglutide for weight loss has been assessed more recently at a much higher dosage variation than was, other, than was otherwise presented um, previously for diabetes management. And it seems to be pretty damn effective. If you sort my channel by GLP-1, you can actually see some of the you know pretty insane uh, some of the insane data that's been presented recently, we have uh, losing over, over 50 pounds with GLP-1 agonists. Um, the ultimate fat loss drug, question mark, 33 pound average weight loss was found. This was like the initial uh, article that kind of, you know, got the hype rolling on semaglutide. And they found that the patients that were pinned with this stuff would lose on average 33 pounds, quite significant. So anyways, there has been some updates on the obesity trials and whatnot and um, i have not yet watched it so i thought you guys would tune in with me and let's see uh see how it's going i will turn her on to 1.25 times speed at the recent endocrine society meeting an update to the step trial was presented now for those of you who don't remember what the step trial was it is basically four different trials looking at the benefits of semaglutide for weight loss by the way pronunciation of it i <laughs> I say it this way because I think it sounds better, but ultimately, I guess it's not really correct. Um, and it could be like turkesterone, you know, some people say turkesterone. What is the correct way? I don't know. People with diabetes and without diabetes. The trial included people who were 18 or older with a BMI greater than or equal to 30 if they didn't have a weight-related pre-existing condition or greater than or equal to 27 if so keep in mind, she said, with or without diabetes. They did. Step one, which was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at a dose of 2.4 milligrams of semaglutide and a lifestyle intervention in patients with obesity who didn't have diabetes. And frankly, many of my patients saw this as a headline and many of my patients wanted to go on this immediately and they didn't realize they'd already been on semaglutide just at the lower one milligram dose that is currently FDA approved for the treatment of type two diabetes. So the one milligram variation is the Ozempic pens that uh, are for diabetes management, but these 2.4 milligram Wegovy or Wegovy or however you say it pens are the uh, you know obesity management um, iteration dosage format, and it's obviously a much much higher dosage than was previously presented for diabetes management, but 
The uh, clinical endpoints presented for um, weight loss are incredible, like very, very substantial. And with the fact that there's no, you know, redlining your, you know, sympathetic nervous system, there's no like cranking your heart rate through the damn roof. There's no uncoupling via something like a DNP or something like this stuff is literally managing satiety essentially and making you not want to eat. Um, and it's pretty damn impressive at what it does. So anyways, let her continue. Step two is for semaglutide and lifestyle in individuals with type two diabetes and obesity. And again, this is at that higher dose of 2.4 milligrams. Step three is 2.4 milligrams of semaglutide in conjunction with intensive behavioral therapy in adults with obesity. And step four is basically looking at the importance, the value of continued semaglutide usage. The published findings from step one show that 2.4 milligrams of semaglutide were associated with a weight loss of 14.9% from a baseline of 232 pounds compared to 2.4% in the placebo group. And this is after 68 weeks. And one of the impressive things about their data is that you really did see weight loss continue to persist at least to a year and then it obviously did not go back up. So this was a gradual slow weight loss over time. And 86% of the participants on the semaglutide group reached a weight loss of 5% or more compared with 32% in placebo. Now imagine just calculating what 15% of your body weight is, or almost 15%, and subtracting that in, well, I guess, you know, maybe, obviously these individuals are going to be natural, they're not enhanced on anabolics, so some of the mass they lose will indeed be lean body mass, you know, it's not just fat. However, like that's a ton of weight to lose, dude. That is very, very substantial given the fact that there is no, you know, dopaminergic activity, no, you know, ADHD medication induced appetite suppression, like things that are otherwise um, far less sustainable, I would say, from a pharmacology aspect and otherwise cardiovascular and neurological stress aspect. Um, this stuff is, you know, very, very impressive at what it does, like I mentioned. Now, if you want to look at it in terms of absolute numbers, the absolute weight loss was 15.3 kilograms, which is almost 34 pounds in these adults without diabetes compared to 2.6 kilograms in the placebo group. Now, in terms of side effects, as we know, the most common side effects to GLP-1 receptor agonists are gastrointestinal, and 4.5% of the participants discontinued due to the GI side effects compared to 0.8% in the placebo group. It's not that bad considering, like for how much weight you're losing, like the effect it's actually having on um, hormonal interactions downstream after you inject this stuff, like having like a variation or a you know disparity of like you know four percent getting GI issues that makes them want to quit compared to placebo, um, like you would expect worse to be honest. Given the substantial increase in dosage increment relative to the diabetes management dose, uh, like I was expecting higher. So at the Endocrine Society, there were two abstracts presented. One was looking at changes in body composition. So they found that there was a 3.5% reduction in total fat mass and a 2% reduction in visceral fat, which is great. We obviously want people to lose visceral fat, but their total lean body mass decreased by 10%. So that's a fairly large fall in lean body mass. Now this finding was mitigated by the fact that the ratio of lean body mass to fat mass improved slightly, but it really brings home the point, at least to me, that we need patients to really work on the physical activity portion of lifestyle change as they're actually losing weight. So she's basically, she's literally like iterating diet principles for bodybuilding essentially here. She's saying, don't just under eat and not train, like give your body the stimulus to retain lean tissue or else you'll end up skinny fat. And it's not, you know, as I'm saying that, she's not necessarily saying that part, but I'm telling you, if you use this stuff or if you do any kind of weight loss strategy and you end up losing, Significant amounts of weight, if you're not training and giving your body the stimulus to retain tissue and or build in any kind of, you know, anabolic environment that is necessary and conducive to actually retaining strength and or building upon it, plus, you know, lean body mass accrual, obviously, you know, as a side tangent to that, you're going to end up losing a significant amount of contractile tissue alongside your fat. And it may not end up being a nice scenario. Like maybe you'll lose a ton of weight on paper, which ultimately is going to improve a lot of your metrics from a health aspect as well. But ultimately, they're not going to be as good as they could be had you lost 
more proportional fat relative to lean mass and improved your insulin sensitivity would be better your glucose tolerance would be better nutrient partitioning would be better cardiovascular health as a byproduct of that would be better a lot of things would be better neurological health mental clarity focus etc like a lot of things are going to be better as a result of not just losing like just indiscriminately losing weight as a result of caloric restriction rather actually giving your body the proper and conducive environment to you know building something that is or you know shredding down to something that is um more able to tolerate everyday stress i don't really know how to put it other than the fact that if you just lose if you let yourself lose a bunch of muscle like ultimately you're not putting yourself in like a metabolically advantageous position and it's not as healthy of an outcome as you could have otherwise had and frankly you're not going to like how you look as much either probably so I want to make sure that people are aware that just because they're taking a medication for weight loss doesn't mean they don't have to do other things like exercise in order to become healthier. The second abstract looked at the baseline characteristics and tried to relate those to basically success at weight loss. And pretty consistently across all groups, there was a nice reduction in weight. But it did stand out that the percent weight loss was greater in female participants. And this makes me smile slightly because in many of our weight loss interventions, we've seen that they work better in men than in women. But in this trial or these trials, it was better in the women. And that those who had a lower body weight at baseline lost more weight than those had, who had a higher weight. So clearly everybody got weight loss. But actually, if you were a bit leaner, and remember all of these individuals were obese, you were more likely to lose a bit more weight and frankly get closer to one's target weight. So those are the updates for the STEP study, and we're going to hear a lot more to come in the next year or so. And then obviously there needs to be FDA approval for the use of semaglutide for weight loss, and finally, of course, reimbursement, so we can provide it to our patients. Thank you. Awesome. That was an excellent summary. You know, went through all four different subsections, explained start to finish exactly what you want to know and saved you all the time of going into PubMed and digging through it yourself. Um, so anyways, very, very promising. You know, I'm obviously very, very interested in staying on top of this stuff, as are many of you guys, I'm sure. Obviously, a lot of our the clinical side at Merrick, you know, very closely following this data as well as it develops. And um, yeah, very promising medication on the horizon. And it's nice to see some obesity management tools present themselves that don't have to do with, you know, things that seem to be very, very taxing on the ROI. Like sometimes some of these medications that are otherwise quite good at what they do for producing weight loss outcomes have a pretty substantial cost associated with them. And I don't mean financial, I mean like literally in a like bodily function standpoint, unfortunately, some of these things like, how many people do you know who abuse Adderall to lose weight? You know, stuff like that is stuff that I would hope this kind of a medication would phase out in individuals who, you know, require it clinically. Not that Adderall is prescribed for weight loss necessarily, but you know, things like Phentermine, like a very, very commonly prescribed Heavy duty stimulant in obesity clinics. Is this, you know, the healthiest way to go about weight loss relative to a GLP-1 agonist? I would argue it's far inferior, you know? So that is what I see as, you know, a very promising class of medications on the horizon. It's been around for a while, but in this particular application, it has not been thoroughly fleshed out to the degree it is now at these dosage formats. So um, should be interesting to see. Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. All the comments help the algorithm. They're much appreciated. Like, Subscribe, check out my blog, moreplaysmoredates.com, follow me on Instagram, at moreplaysmoredates, Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description below. At Merrick, we are staying on top of all of this literature and data, and we ensure that we have medical professionals on staff who are um, well-versed in everything associated with this. We actually have experts on staff that work in obesity clinics as well. It's literally their bread and butter, and they're very aware and thoroughly educated on the therapeutic efficacy um, and applications of these kind of medications, both for their diabetes management, but you know, more recently their you know obesity management potential, and it's very very promising. And um, again, like I mentioned, looking forward to seeing the developments of them as they go, as are our um, staff. So, anyways, check out uh, Merrick if you want to get high quality diagnostics and medical oversight. Um, as well as Gorilla Mind, nootropic formulas, Gorilla Mode pre-workout formulas, and design myself from scratch, my recommended diet model for gaining muscle. 
In sports performance, this is the kind of thing that if you were on semaglutide, for example, and you're trying to lose weight, ensuring you have adequate protein intake, getting micronutrient-dense foods in, making sure your macros are not just you know empty and you're just eating if it fits your macro shit and hoping to lose weight through sheer caloric reduction. Rather, you're eating micronutrient-dense variations of your food in order to provide the substrate to facilitate hormone production and physiologic functions and whatnot that would otherwise aid in muscle retention and or growth and anabolic activity spiking mTOR sufficiently that kind of stuff is covered through this diet and i highly recommend you uh check it out if you are trying to look for a turnkey idiot proof way to uh, maximizing your gym results so anyways you can check that out as well as anything else i'm associated with in the video description below thank you guys for watching talk to you soon